Hello, hello, hello. There you go. All right, you can, you can get seated for a second, then we'll, we'll um, jump right into this. I'll get you to stand up again. <laughs> It'll be good. Tonight, I'm going to teach you something tonight that I, I really believe is going to revolutionize your life. And I don't say it lightly. Um, and that is that, that if there's anything that, that you should ask yourself is that why is it that the enemy wants to attack me? I think oftentimes the church talks about your enemy, talks about the adversary from a victim's perspective. But you don't ask yourself, why is someone so focused on my life and wants to know every move that I make, every relationship that I have, Am I that important to the enemy for him to want to attack me as much as he does? What I'm going to do tonight is, as I did last night, I spoke to your heart. And tonight I'm going to speak to your mind. And then we're going to get into your spirit. And then you're going to expand in the way that God wants you to. So let's stand to our feet as we open up God's word. Go with me to Luke chapter 11, and we love your pastors. They're awesome. You guys already know that, and uh, we're so proud of them. I was telling my wife last night when I got home, just so proud of, of them, and it was a surreal moment for a moment there yesterday during worship, just being in the corner there worshiping. I was just taking it in and just sitting there going, God, I remember this was a conversation, and now it's a reality. And so it's beautiful. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 24. And it says, And when an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest. But when it finds none, it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds that its former home is all swept and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. And I want to speak to you tonight a message I've entitled, Filled and Fulfilled. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation and give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray you give us a mind to perceive and a heart to receive all that you have for us. Father, I ask tonight that you would bless us in Jesus' name. Come on, and all the people that came on on a Saturday night, say amen, amen. amen. You may be seated today in the presence of the Lord. It's, it's quite easy for even people who are far from God to understand who God is. It's probably even more easier to understand who Jesus is because when we think of Jesus, we think of the fact that he was the son of God or he was prophesied by many different prophets in many different times and he died for our sins and he resurrected. And it's why so many people will be here in two weeks and the reason why is because they all acknowledge that Jesus is who he is and therefore, even though I may not live for him, I still believe who he is. But one of the things that complicates our faith with, with lack of clarity is the Holy Spirit. Who is he? What is he? It's difficult to think that, that a God can be one in three or three in one. But we don't have that same thought towards an egg. An egg is one and three and three and one. You have the shell, you have the white, and then you have the yolk. It's one and three, three and one. No one has a problem thinking that liquid water is the same thing. 
it's one and three and three and one. It can be ice, it can be liquid, and it can be vape or vapor. And so we don't have a, an issue thinking that way. And then when you think of our lives, the only thing that God ever created to be in his image and likeness, God never created a tree to be a tree. I mean, to, 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 to look like him. God created mankind to look like him. And when you and I were created, we were created in the image and likeness of God, which would mean that we would have to be one in three and three in one. We would have to have our spirit, our soul, and our body. And each one of those components have a functionality to it that when all three of them work together, you are a force that cannot be stopped. The interesting thing about the devil is that he wasn't created that way. The devil is created as an angel. An angel isn't one in three and three in one. Only you are. And the reason why the enemy is always after you is because you are the one that carries the same thing that Jesus carried here on earth. And you don't see yourself as a threat, but he does. And that is why he spends countless time trying to attack you. Why is that? Because he understands that you carry a power inside of you that if you actually know what you have, you would be a force to be reckoned with. Can I teach tonight? And so, and so when God created man, he created him in his image and likeness, which meant that man was the only thing that God created as a reflection. He didn't create man as a substance. He created man as a reflection, meaning that when God created a tree, it would be a tree. It would be nothing else but a tree. When you think about a dog, a dog will be a dog. It cannot be nothing but a dog. It's why they don't have comparison problems. But man was created as a reflection. In other words, we weren't created as a substance. We were created to reflect something that is a substance. And so this is why when you were in sin, you look like it. This is why when you were in addiction, you look like it. Because you were a reflection to a substance. It's not by accident that they call drug abuse or, or, or alcohol abuse a substance abuse because it is a substance in which it wrecks with your identity of who you are. Wow. And so your whole life, labels have been trying to be placed on you and you accepted them because you didn't know who you were. And nothing that God ever created except man has an identity crisis. Why does man have an identity crisis and not a dog or a cat or a tree or the sun? It's because they were all created as a substance. You were created as a reflection. And so you are constantly in the search of finding who you were always meant to be. This is why Jesus... When, 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 this is why the Bible says that God said, let us make man in our image, in likeness. And when Jesus chose his disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, he says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He never used the word lead. He didn't say, let us lead man. Or Jesus didn't say, come, let me lead you into fishermen. He says, don't let me make you into fishermen. Why did he say that? Why did God say that about you? And why did Jesus say it about his disciples? Because anything that has to be made isn't made yet. Which means that God is forming you into what he thinks of you. And so... God, in the first five days of creation, everything that was created came out of his mouth. But when it came to man, he didn't speak it. He had to place his hands on the dust of the ground and form man into his image. So the hand of God is never on a tree and it's never on a dog. The only place the hand of God is, is on you and I. 
And so the reason why the devil wants to attack you is because he knows the hand of God is forming you and making you into everything he's called you to be. And so what happened to your life when you got sick and tired of not knowing who you are or you wanted something fast, you decided, I'm not going to allow God's hand to make me no more. I'm going to let other hands upon my life. Well, your hands don't have the ability to make anything because your hands don't have a mind. Your hands can only form what the picture of the mind already has, which means when God decided I'm going to make you, he already had a picture of what your life should look like. And this is why he navigates your life and he forms you and he molds you and he digs inside of you. And sometimes he has to hit you a little bit. But when you decided, God, maybe you're not making me the way I want to, or maybe my life isn't going the way I want to. You decided to go in your own direction, and then you allowed everybody else's hand to be upon you. That cute guy that came into your life and said, you're all that in a bag of chips with the Kit Kat in the bag, and you was like, oh, okay. And so next thing you know, you allowed that person to make you who you are until one day you woke up and you looked at yourself and you can't even identify who you were. You were like, what kind of person have I become? Because the truth of the matter is, is that when you get the wrong hands on your life, your life doesn't become formed, it becomes deformed. And this is the purpose of sin. The purpose of sin is to deform your life. And so when you came to Jesus, your image and your likeness was deformed. This is, the, this, is why the, this is why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to change your life. He came to transform your life. And so your life went from being deformed to now it's being transformed. And it's being transformed into the image that God has always called you to be. And so when your life was in sin, your life was like being in Egypt. You were a slave to anything that came your way. And so the world is like Egypt. It will limit your life. Nobody's born poor. All poor people are are people that have taken on a poor mindset. Nobody's born broke. It's you became broke when your life took on a broken mindset. And so what happens is, is that you are being trained by a world that's against you. And all Egypt teaches you to do is make a Pharaoh richer and you remain poor. And so when God delivered the children out of Egypt in which they were bound for 430 years, they came out with the mindset of Egypt. This is why in one night he delivered them out of Egypt, but it took him 40 years to get Egypt out of them. Come on, can I teach like I, I'm a, I told you, I'm going to. And so what it is, is, is that God has already delivered you, but he's trying to deliver your mindset now because he has to get you to the, to the, he had to get you back with the right image. Now he needs to get you back with the right likeness. Because what people, what, what most churches stop at is that God, you're supposed to look like God and sound like God. And we're so, yes, we were born in the image of God. But let's not forget, he, he not only gave us his image, but he gave us his what? Likeness. Which means this is why you should walk in joy and peace and love. And when you don't have these feelings, they're not like God. And when they're not like God, this is why it doesn't feel right. And so your life is supposed to live in abundance because the last time I checked God, God's not, God's always in abundance. We should live a life full of happiness, a full of joy. It doesn't mean we want to have battles. It just means we wouldn't lose. And so what happened was, was that your mind was being formed while you were in Egypt. And this is why you took on that mindset. So when, so, so when Paul's describing your transformation in 2 Corinthians 5, he's speaking of your spirit. 
he says, old things have passed away. Behold, all things become brand new. But he also goes back to Romans chapter 12, where he says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. He's talking about two different components of your makeup, but he's giving you the same analogy. And that is, it's not change, it's transformation. And the word transformation in the Greek is what means, is what the word we get metamorphosis from. He's giving you the picture on how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. A caterpillar is crawling on the ground and always looks up. That's Egypt. Then it has to go into a cocoon and it goes through a change. That's the wilderness. And then all of a sudden it comes out and it's flying high. That's the promised land. You see, God has to take each and every one of us through a metamorphosis to become everything you're called to be. If you ever talk to a caterpillar, you would never convince it that it could be a butterfly. But it has no idea that it was never created to be on the ground. Its ultimate destiny was to live above. And so God is changing your life. Well, how does he change it? He changes it through the Holy Spirit. Let me show you the three aspects of who you are. When you look at the three aspects, you guys got that up or you guys don't? The three aspects of who you are is that you are a spirit and a soul and a body, which means that your spirit is the fullness of God because it is the very thing that God gave you that no one else has. Your spirit will live forever. Your mind is the articulation. It's where you articulate the things in, uh, uh, of, uh, of life. So it's your soul. And then you have your body. And that's the very thing that's compatible to this world that you live it out. And so you have the spirit, which is the fullness of God. And then you have, watch this, the soul, which is the place of articulation. And then you have the body, which is the place of action. Your body being here on earth and subject to the earth has limits. Your spirit that is of another world doesn't have any limits. And so your life was limited when you were living in the flesh. But when you learn to walk in the spirit, you walk in an unlimited power that God has for you. And so what God's trying to teach his children, that's different than how you were trained, and that is you're to live according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. The flesh is governed by its feelings, but the spirit is governed by faith. And so we walk by faith, come on, and not by what? Not by sight. Because at the end of the day, when you actually make decisions, your whole life you were taught to make decisions on how you feel. That's your flesh. That's your Egypt. But now that you're born again and you're supposed to walk in the spirit, how many know you don't make decisions based on your flesh? You make decisions based on the word of God because that's your spirit in Jesus name. And so what happens is, is oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go deep today. So because what you got to realize is you got to realize that in Genesis 1, that was your spirit. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, he formed man from the dust of the ground. That was your flesh. Your spirit was born without sin. It wasn't until you came out your mother's womb in the flesh that you entered into a world full of sin. Your first creation was spirit. You were on God's mind before he put the seed into your mother's womb. And so all of a sudden now you're born of the flesh and it's, it's sin. Well, guess what? 
You have to be now born again. What does born again mean? This is when God, when Nicodemus asked Jesus, what must I do? Do I need to go back into your mother, my mother's womb and come out again? He goes, no, you just got to be born of, born of blood and born of water. What he was saying was, was that when you're born again, you go back to your original creation of how you were always supposed to live. And that's living by the spirit. Come on, somebody, and not by your flesh. You got to always remember that you were a spirit being before you ever became a human being. And you've lived your life trying to perfect being a human being and have spent limited time learning how to live as a spirit being. Your human being has limitations. Your spirit being is unlimited. Your spirit can't get cancer. Your spirit doesn't know poverty. Your spirit doesn't get anxiety. Come on, talk to me. When you learn to live in the spirit, it doesn't matter what your flesh is going through because your spirit walks in an unlimited power and your flesh has limits. And, and if you want to overcome the limits, you got to tap into what's unlimited in your life. When I went, when my wife and I moved from L.A. to, to Indio, it, it was, it, there was nothing there. I mean, there, there was, there, it was there, but there was nothing there. And the people... The, the people that were there, they, 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 they were just satisfied that they, 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 they had life. And the Lord said, you're going to raise the level of their thinking. You're going to teach them how to walk in the spirit. And the reason why for 20 years the church has been able to do what it's doing and it's done. And the reason why people have come out of the ashes and now own businesses and car dealerships and all these different things is because they've learned how to tap into what's unlimited. You don't have to live another day questioning yourself when you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. God called you to be the head and not the tail. You're called to live above and not beneath. Come on, somebody. The Bible says this, watch this, in John chapter 14, it says, and I will ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate to help you. And he will be with you forever. But the advocate, who's the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Slavery is not an action. Slavery is a mindset. If you take the hymns of the, old, of the church... And you compare them to the new songs that are sung today. The, the hymns of the church, very old, especially in the, the, in the African-American and, and, and the minority churches. The reason why these hymns weren't, didn't have the language of length like the songs do today is because slavery wasn't sitting there working for a man. It was give, never giving them the ability to use their mind. And so our songs were just a few words because it was the only education we were allowed to have. And when you understand that revelation is what breaks you out of slavery. If I can get my mind the way God wants it to be, I will begin to live a life I've always dreamed of having. Talk to me, somebody. And so what's important is that the Bible says he'll teach you all things, right? And he will, and, and will remind you of everything that he said about you. So, let me, give you a, let me give you a couple of things of who the advocate really means, right? He's a comforter, he's a teacher, he's an intercessor, and he's a counselor. Now, here's the thing about the Holy Spirit that most people get confused, and that is that we think the Holy Spirit is only dynamic. It's why often we always refer to him as the fire and the oil. He comes in the dynamic. But he wants to remain in the intimate. When he came in the book of Acts, he came with the dynamic, fire, oil, wind. And everybody goes, that's the Holy Spirit. 
No, no, no. At the end of the day, listen to me. At the end of the day, watch this. He's at the intimate is that he's the comforter. He's the teacher. He's the intercessor. He's the counselor. He's the guide. And here's the leader. This is the problem. The problem is, is that we're always looking for the dynamic. We're looking for the fire, the wind, the oil. And then everyone's like, man, the Holy Spirit's here. No, the Holy Spirit has always been here. (laughs) But see, the reason why you've equated your mind to who the Holy Spirit is by fire, wind, and oil is because those are the three entities that you could feel. So it's your senses that tells you the Holy Spirit is here. But the Holy Spirit wants to be intimate, teacher, comforter, counselor, leader, Every day when I wake up in the morning, I say, welcome, Holy Spirit. Thank you for being in my life. I don't feel the oil or the wind Mm -hmm. or the fire, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean he's not here. I want to make sure that I'm being guided. I want to make sure I'm being led. Those who are the sons of God are led by the spirit of God. I want to make sure he's leading me, as the Bible says, into all truth, because that's his purpose. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is not goosebumps. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is not even for you to run around. The purpose of the Holy Spirit, can I get a little deeper? The purpose of the Holy Spirit is not even get you to fall backwards. Or some people say pushed. Is it biblical? Of course it is. We remember what happened, right? Remember when, 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 when the Roman soldiers came looking for Jesus and they asked the question, where is this Jesus of Nazareth? Well, obviously they couldn't see him because the disciples were hiding him. But he was there. And then the Bible says, and when he stepped out amongst them, in other words, when his presence was revealed, the Bible says, they fell backwards. You want to know what falling backwards means? It means when the presence of God makes himself revealed to you. But who did it fall back to? The only two times that people in the Bible fell back in the presence of God were all unbelievers. Because unbelievers fall back in the presence of God, but believers fall forward in the presence of God. The Bible says we bow in the presence of God. Not to say that one day if if you're a believer and you fall back, no, it just means that you didn't believe in that area. So God had to overwhelm you with his presence so that you can believe. But you shouldn't always be looking to fall backwards. I get people praying at the church. We do prayer, you know, and they and I grab the back of their head and say, sweetheart, you don't have to, you don't have to fall backwards. You know, the Holy Spirit's right here. He's not a feeling. Come on, he's a spirit. And so the Holy Spirit's job isn't to give you goosebumps. The Holy Spirit's job is to lead you into all truth. Who is truth? Truth is a person. Truth's not a fact. Truth is a person. It's what, it's what got the, the Pharisees mad when Jesus stood up and says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one can say the Father except through me. He didn't stand up and say, I am the way and I am the facts. Because facts change. Truth doesn't. And so the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to lead you, come on somebody, into what? Into all truth. And so when, so when the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth, watch this, he leads you to the place where you will constantly stay free. Look what the Bible says this in John 16. Here's another thing. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, He'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but watch this. He will speak only what he hears. I'm going to say that again. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will speak only what he hears. He will speak only 
what is here. In other words, there has to be a conversation before there is a conversion in your life. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it is the sign that him and God has had a conversation about you. Because he can only speak what he what? What he hears. That means he has to hear from God to speak to you. That means that heaven has to have a conversation about you before he can speak to you. So when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, oh, some of you are getting it. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it's because heaven has had a conversation about you. And so this is why you want to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. So that he what? Speaks to you. Because you always want heaven to have a continual conversation about you. And so he will guide you into, come on, into all truth. The job of it, well, Pastor Obed, what is truth? Truth is a person. Well, let's go a little deeper than that. Truth is not subjective. It is not a consensual cultural construct. It is not an invalid, outdated, irrelevant concept. Truth is the self-expression of God. Truth is thus theological and biological. It is the reality God has created and defined and over which he rules. Truth is therefore a moral issue of every human being. So truth isn't a fad. It's not something that can change. Truth is a person that stood up and said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I am the one who doesn't change. Yep. It doesn't matter what government says truth is. Truth is not a fact. Truth is the self-expression of God. And if we sit there and try to and try to argue what truth is, we're trying to argue who God is. He leads you into all truth. So here's what happened to your life. When you got saved, and say this is, this is your life, it's my luggage here. When you got saved, your life was headed far from the truth. Because your life was being led by your feelings. The only thing you knew was Egypt. And so if you felt it, you did it. And so no, you, none of you, none of you, you know, were in your mother's arm. And when your mother was cradling, you said, oh, I'm just going to raise up a drug addict. No, 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 no. Oh, I'm just going to raise up an alcoholic. No, none, none of you even had aspirations of being a drug addict or being an, 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 an alcoholic. You didn't have them aspirations. Those feelings led to choices. And you began to choose them. And, and, and the reality was, was that you were being led. But what were you being led by? Well, one day, God had to open you up, and he had to show you what you were led by. Because what was causing all of these things was that you were critical. Well, why did you become critical? Because you became hurtful. Anybody that's critical is just expressing that they're hurtful. Okay, and then all of a sudden, you, 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 you were overwhelmed with worry. Worry is not... A thing, worry is a feeling. So once again, you're being led by your feelings. Oh, you had fear. Fear is not the problem. Fear is a feeling. Well, if you ain't being led into all truth, then you must be lying. Here's the issue. When you listen to a lie, you empower the liar. The enemy is a liar because there's no truth in him. But when you listen to him, the lie, you empower the liar. And in order to listen to him, you got to get down because the enemy's beneath your feet. So in order to hear him, you got to lower your standard. And this is why sin lowered your standard for your morals to be crossed. 
You sat there and did things wrong. He's like, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't made for this. Of course you weren't. You just lowered your standards. Then you had pride. This is when you didn't want to listen to anybody. Pride isn't stubbornness. Pride is anger. What it is is that you think pride is, oh, that person's prideful because they're stubborn. No, that person's prideful because they're angry. Something inside of them has caused them to be angry. The next is anger. You have anger. Oh, man, I'm just, I, I just, I'm, I'm angry. Well, what are you angry about? Well, I'm just angry. And you don't realize, man, this was me making all these decisions. Some of you don't even realize that even some of the relationships that you had, you were making those decisions based on anger. What about lust? Ooh, man. All pornography is, is just an image. That's all it is. It's why pornography stimulates the mind, but it can't touch the spirit. It only satisfies your flesh, but it can't satisfy and fulfill your life. And then there's addiction. And so when, 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 when the Holy Spirit, we'll use, we'll use this as the Holy Spirit, when you accepted Jesus to come into your heart, the Holy Spirit knew that all these things were in you. And for all, most of your life, your life was being led by these things. And so you came to gospel. And when you came to gospel, what did God have to do? He had to lay you down. <laughs> and when he laid you down because you were rock bottom, he had to take all this stuff out of you. And what he did was that he put something inside of you called the Holy Spirit. Because he knew the whole time you were being led by your feelings that were guiding you into lies. But if I put something inside of you called the Holy Spirit, he will lead you into all truth. And so what happened is, is that the Holy Spirit came inside of you. He sealed your salvation. And now all of a sudden, you were being led to truth. Now, when you wanted to revert back to lies in your old way of thinking, he would convict you. <laughs> Conviction doesn't mean this or this. Yeah, yeah. Conviction means... Conviction means that there is an option that's better than what you're choosing. And so what happens is your life got convicted. Well, oh, Pastor Billy, man, he was preaching too hard today, man. I mean, it was conviction. No, you ought to thank God for conviction. Because conviction is an option that tells you there's something that's greater than what you're presently experiencing. And so the Holy Spirit is in you. And the reason why the Holy Spirit is in you is not to give you goosebump feelings, not to get you to fall backwards. The Holy Spirit that's in you is to guide you. Now you have a compass and a guide and a teacher, a comforter living inside of you. So when you're going through storms, and you're like, how in the world is all this happening to me? What you forget is that the Holy Spirit is inside of you. And when you're sitting there going, God, I don't understand what's happening. It's the Holy Spirit trying to say, be a little bit more intimate with me. Because if you are, I'll give you, I'll teach you everything to get past all this. And you'll get to the truth that he has for your life. So the Holy Spirit comes in your life. And he comes in you to guide you. But then one day, Jesus, uh, Isaiah prophesies, and then Jesus stands up one day in Luke chapter 4, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me. Anointed means empowered to prosper. Empowered to greatness. Your life wasn't created to be average. 
Your life wasn't created to live with mediocrity. If God created you average, he'd have never made you an original. Because nothing that is original is average. You spent your whole life trying to be a copycat. When you're called to be original. And when God created you, he created you to be an original, which he created you to live above and not beneath. Not to live mediocre, but to live in excellence. And what happened was, was that the Holy Spirit came in you and he started guiding you and the Spirit of God now came upon you. The question is, how could the Holy Spirit be in you and on you? The Holy Spirit comes in you to guide you, but he comes on you to use you. Now, all of a sudden, my life isn't looking and reflecting like this. People look at me and go, man, you look different. I see a big old smile on your face. Man, you don't feel like, you know, you're carrying a bunch of weight. What's been going on? What are they noticing? They're noticing what's on you, what started what was in you. And so the Holy Spirit's transformation starts within you, and it makes its way upon you. Now you're not looking like sin. Talk to me. You're looking like the one you're reflecting. This is when you know I'm not ordinary. You know that I am royal now. Because I'm a king's daughter. I'm a king's son. Therefore, I don't look like what I, what I used to look like. I'm looking like I'm extraordinary. I'm looking like I'm powerful. I'm looking like I got influence. And all of a sudden now, my life is going in the direction that God has always called me to be. You won't even look like you were raised in this area. You will look like a kingdom child. That when people look at you, they say, man, there's something different about you. And there's something different about gospel. And the thing is, is that when gospel got birthed, some of you are like, what kind of church is this? The reason why you kept on saying that is because it didn't look like nothing else. It looked like, it, like the, a reflection of the kingdom of the way it's supposed to look like. We're not supposed to look beat up and messed up from the chest up. No, God created the finest things on earth to serve us. Am I going too deep or can I, can I go? Because when God created, when God created the heavens, he created it for himself. There's nothing in the heavens that God created that he created only for himself. The angels, they all cry out, holy, holy, holy. But if God created you in his image and likeness, then he would have to create something that would serve you. So he says, well, I'm going to create the earth and I'm going to give you my image. I'm going to give you my likeness and then I'm going to give you dominion. He says, you'll have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and every creeping creature. The only thing he left out was man. Because we're not called to rule over man. Husbands, you're not called to rule your wives. She belongs to the Lord. And you remember that. Because as soon as you cross that boundary and you try to rule her, God will get in the way. And that's not yours to rule. That is something I gave you as a compliment. All you ladies missed your amen on that one. Amen. So, and so God gave you, so God gave, God gave man dominion. Dominion is the word domain. The domain that God gave us was the earth. It's why everything in the earth serves us. The only thing on the earth that serves him is you and I. But everything on the earth serves us. God don't care about a filet mignon. So he didn't create a cow for himself. He created it for us. The gold and the silver, that's not the currency of heaven. It's the currency of earth. He created it for us. 
Everything he created on the earth serves you. And the Holy Spirit empowers you because he gives you the wisdom, the understanding, the, the, the giftings within you, and then he empowers you when he's on you. And this is when you are walking in a power that's in you and you're walking with an authority that's on you. And so the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to lead you into all truth that's in you. But the purpose of the Holy Spirit that's on you is to create something on you to give to somebody else. So he decided, what can I grow that's on them that comes from in them? And God gave a revelation to Paul as I close. He said, you will know they are of me by the fruit they bear. Fruit start growing from within. And then all of a sudden they grow on the outside. And so when God guides you into all truth and God begins to empower you to prosper and then all of a sudden God begins to do great things in your life, what are people seeing? They're not seeing sin. They're not seeing addiction. They're not seeing that you're critical. They don't see worry on you. They don't see fear. They don't see anger. They don't see lust. They don't see pride. What do they see? Where does the fruit come from? From within. But why does he give you fruit? An apple is never created for the apple to enjoy itself. You don't go picking apples and the apple tree go, don't take that from me. You can't eat that. That belongs to me. You go pick an apple so that you enjoy it. So when God empowers you to prosper and empowers you to do exploits, that with man it's impossible. You bear the fruit and the fruit is not for you to enjoy. It's for others to pick off what's your life and for them to enjoy. And that's why the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Why, why, why does God want that? It's because people cannot see what's in you. They're trying to figure out what's on you. So the only thing you can do is hand them something that's grown from you. And when you do, they taste it. And they say, whoa, I've never tasted nothing like that. It could be an encouraging word. It could just be kindness. It could be the joy that's coming out of you. It could be the peace that you get them borrow. It could be the faith that they needed with you joining with them. All of that comes when you're walking in the Holy Spirit. And when you're walking in the Holy Spirit and the Spirit lives in you, it's to empower you to live a life that you alone never could. When God created the garden, He created everything in the garden to serve Adam and Eve. He told them, don't touch. That serpent came in, and when he came in, he spoke to her. The problem was, was not the devil speaking to Eve. The problem was, she was listening too long. The enemy will speak to you But that's where it should stop. 
Because the goal is he wants to have a conversation with you. But you got to remember, there's already a conversation about you that the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Come on, somebody. And so what happened was, was that she, the serpent told her, if you eat of this fruit, you'll be like God. The problem was, we're not supposed to be like God. We were created to be God-like. And he changed two words. Every time you sin, you change your position from being God-like to trying to do it on your own and say, I'm going to be like God. And so what happened? What happened? All the fruit got destroyed. By what? The thorns and the thistles that came from the ground. And what happened was, was that what was on them came off of them. And for the first time, they saw each other. So what did they do? They couldn't pick up fruit. So they had to pick up the leaves. You want to know what leaves are? Are unproduced fruit. And so they picked up leaves to cover themselves. Because every time you lose a covering, you'll always settle for a cover-up. And the thing is, is that people will recognize later, you're not bearing fruit. You have an unproduced look on your life. And when you have an unproduced look on your life, no one takes you serious and you lose your influence. And so Jesus knew there was, God knew there was a problem. He says, okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bless Abraham. I'm going to put it on the children of Israel. The problem with Israel was that they came out in one night, but it took them 40 years. How do you, how do you, how does it take you 40 years to go 13 days, a straight line. If you look at Egypt to Canaan, it was a straight line. It's why it was supposed to take them 11 days. Why did it take them 40 years? Because they didn't go in a straight line. They went in a circle. Because at the end of the day, when you're in sin, your life becomes a cycle because you're in the circle and this is why you continue to go through the same thing and you keep on landing up in the same place because at the end of the day your life is not going straight your life is going in a cycle and it's called a pattern and that's why Paul says do not be conformed to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind because all the time you thought it was a problem but it's not a problem it's a pattern and the pattern has to be broken so the problem never shows up again well, you say, Pastor Robert, what do you mean? Well, your daddy was an alcoholic. Your, da your granddaddy was an alcoholic. Your great great dad granddaddy was an alcoholic. And now you're tripping with alcohol. How many know alcohol is not the problem? It's the pattern. Yeah. Well, you know, I got divorced. Well, why did you get divorced? Because my mama got divorced. Why did your mama get divorced? Because her mama got divorced. Why did her mama, mama, mama get divorced? How many know divorce is not a problem? It's a what? It's a pattern. And if you want to break the problem, come on, somebody, you got to break the pattern. It's what God wants to do. Well, you know, we were, we were poor. I, 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 don't, I don't have enough. You know, why don't you have enough? Well, because my mama didn't have enough. I didn't raise. I was raised not having enough. My daddy, well, why weren't they? Why weren't, why weren't you raised not having enough? Well, because my daddy's daddy didn't have enough. And why did your daddy, daddy? How I many you know poverty is not a problem? It's a what? It's a pattern. Poverty shows up in your mind before it's revealed in your pocket. That's a tweet. <laughs> and so what happens is that God had to send someone. He says, okay, I'm going to send my son. And my son is a king. But a king, if he's recognized, wears a crown of gold. 
But when they hung him on the cross and they put the sign on top of him, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, they thought they were mocking him by not putting a crown of gold. But what they put on him was a crown of thorns. Why did they have to put a crown of thorns? Because it was the thorns in the garden that killed the fruit. And so God says, if you put it on me, I'll reverse that. And he reversed the curse of poverty when he put the crown of thorns on his head. And then he told his disciples, for three years, what's going to happen? And they found themselves hiding. Even to the point that he told one and he says, you'll deny me three times. And he finds him hiding, uncovered. And what happens? He resurrects. And when he resurrects, the woman who saw him first couldn't even notice him. Because it's what transformation does when your life is resurrected. And so he goes to the disciples. And what does he do? He recovers them. Go into the upper room. I'm going to send somebody. And the Holy Spirit came in them. He came on them. And the same man that couldn't witness to three people now had the boldness to witness to 3,000. Why is that? Because when the Holy Spirit comes in you and the Holy Spirit comes on you, what you couldn't do in your past, you can do it in your future because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. When you understand, I'm done, man. When you understand your life doesn't have to be the way it was. He's more than the God of salvation. He's the God of empowerment. He's the God that will take the seed of dreams inside of you and make it happen. Your life, your life came into this world, it's your daughter, as a seed. And when God took that seed and stuck it in her womb, the seed already had its instructions. The seed already had everything that she would be already inside of it. And all God had to do was germinate it. Let it grow and let it grow and let it grow. This is why when it came to Moses and the time it came to Jesus, both leaders in those days says, go after the firstborn and kill the seeds of those. The devil ain't after your life. He's after your seed inside of you. He's been trying to see, kill that seed of greatness inside of you so that you would never come into the fruition that your life was always called to be. Your life is blessed. Your life is favored. Your life has abundance inside of it. You got to rise up and let the seed of God take perfection inside of you and watch that seed come everything that God has always called you to be in Jesus' name. Seeds of greatness in you. Seeds of greatness inside of you. Come on, stand to your feet. We're going to pray for you right now. I'm, a, I'm just going to pray. I ain't, I, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. I was going to speak on something completely tomorrow. I'm going to speak on something different. Glory to God. I wanted to teach you tonight because teaching will get you a lot further than me laying hands on you. But teach you that there's seeds of greatness in you. That greatness lives in you. Stop settling for what's least. You've been called to be the best. Be the best version of yourself. When people see you, they should see greatness in you. Pastor Robert, when you walk into a room, you change it. I know. Just like you. Because there's seeds of greatness in you. 
When you know who you are, people don't have to tell you. They'll just agree with it. I tell my daughter all the time, she's low, she white and Puerto Rican, beautiful. She was here a couple weeks ago, curly hair. I said, baby, when, when a guy tells you you look good, you say, I know. My daddy tells me all the time. It's inside of you. It's greatness. There's businesses in this place. There's ownership in this place. There's some of you that have had a dream to own a business. God didn't put that desire in you just to put it in you. The seed is already in it. You just let it grow. You got to believe that you can. God wants you to be a blessing so everybody can pick the fruit off your life. Come on, somebody. Come on, stretch your hands towards